Welcome to the next topic in chemistry, crude oil. So these are the learning objectives for the topic. Uh, lots of no objectives. So for example, know that crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons. Uh, describing the industrial process of fractional isolation, which we touched on in the first unit. Uh, know the names and uses of these fractions. Uh, know the fuel is a substance when burned that releases heat energy. Uh, know the products of both combustion in terms of incomplete and complete combustion. And know why carbon monoxide, which is one of the products of incomplete combustion, is toxic. Know that car engines, uh, basically what happens is that nitrogen from uh, the air and oxygen from the air react to form nitrogen oxides. And also sulfur dioxides are formed in combustion. And understand how these two oxides contribute to the idea of acid rain. What is combustion? Well, combustion involves fossil fuels. And fossil fuels um, come from the anaerobic decomposition products of plants and animals. And they include coal, natural gas, and petroleum. So what does that mean? It means that millions of years ago, plants and animals living in the sea died and fell to the bottom. And these layers of sediment formed on top of them. Their shells and skeletons formed the rocks that we know as limestone, and the soft tissue was gradually changed by the heat and energy, uh, heat energy and uh, high pressure involved in the, the earth uh, into something called crude oil, which is this combination of, of coal, natural gas, and petroleum. Crude oil is finite, it's non renewable, so once all the existing supplies have been used, it won't be replaced. So crude oil is this mixture of hydrocarbons, and a hydrocarbon is a compound consisting of uh, only hydrogen and carbon. And there's lots of different hydrocarbons of various sizes in crude oil, which requires uh, separation. And hydrocarbons produce carbon dioxide when they burn completely with oxygen. So hydrocarbons can undergo two different forms of combustion. Uh, you have complete combustion, where the hydrocarbon reacts completely with oxygen in the atmosphere to form carbon dioxide and water. And you have incomplete combustion as well, where this time is not sufficient oxygen, so the hydrocarbon um, burns to form carbon dioxide and water, just as you would with complete combustion, but because there is insufficient oxygen, a gas called carbon monoxide forms as well as carbon. And what are the dangers of carbon monoxide? Well, carbon monoxide is a poisonous gas, which is one reason why complete combustion is preferred over incomplete combustion. So what makes it poisonous? Well, what happens is the carbon monoxide is absorbed in the lungs, as we can see from the diagram, and binds with hemoglobin in our um, red blood cells, and that stops uh, oxygen binding to it, Okay, which means that we don't get sufficient amounts of oxygen and we can die. This is known as carbon monoxide poisoning, because it reduces the capacity of blood to carry oxygen. So in terms of separating crude oil into the various important fractions, we used fractional distillation. So just to uh, remind yourself of the process of fr uh, fractional distillation. In fractional distillation, uh, basically what you're doing is separating a mixture, in this case going to be cured oil, into its fractions by their boiling points, by heating them till the fraction turns into a gas. And you can condense that gas and collect it. So essentially, we see in step one, you're basically heating a mixture until the liquid with the lower boiling point begins to evaporate off. And then in step two, this vapor is then condensed into a condenser to form the pure liquid, which we call the fraction. Okay, and then once all this liquid has evaporated from the solution, the temperature begins to rise again, and the next liquid vaporizes or turns into a gas. Which is step three. 
So basically, it's a process of heating, evaporating, cooling, condensing, and then repeating the process again until all the fractions have been collected. So in terms of the fractional distillation of crude oil, this is how it occurs. You're basically heating the crude oil uh, at around about 400 degrees Celsius, 350 to 400 degrees Celsius. Okay, you start off at a lower temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, and then basically you're capturing these uh, fractions. So as the number of carbon atoms in a hydrogen molecule increases, the physical properties of the compounds change. Most of these changes are a result of the increased attraction between neighbouring molecules. Okay, As the uh, molecules get bigger, the intermolecular forces of attraction become stronger and it becomes more difficult to pull one molecule away from its neighbours. Okay, So at the top, uh, the smaller molecules begin to evaporate off. Okay. Essentially, a tall column can be fitted above the crude oil with a several condensers coming off at different heights. The column is very hot at the bottom and cool at the top, as you can see. Substances with high boiling points condense at the bottom, and substances with low boiling points condense at the top. So the substances which are long, in terms of the chains, will be at the bottom. The substances which have smaller chains won't take much energy to uh, break the intermolecular bonds, so lower temperatures. And the substances in crude oil can be separated using this fractional dist distillation, therefore. So the crude oil is evaporated and the vapours are allowed to condense in a fractionating column. Each fraction contains a hydrocarbon molecules with similar numbers of carbon atoms. And the main fractions include refinery gases, gasoline, naphtha, kerosene, diesel oil, fuel oil, and a residue at the bottom which contains bitumen. So the larger the molecule, the higher the boiling point, okay, because of the uh, intermolecular bonds being broken, there's more of them if they're longer, and the liquids become less volatile, the bigger the hydrocarbon, the more slowly it evaporates at room temperature. This is again because the uh, bigger molecules are strongly attracted, more strongly attracted to each other, so they don't turn to gas as easily, and also the liquids become more viscous and flow less easily as you go down, okay, as you can see yeah. Okay. And the liquids become darker in colour as well. Bigger hydrocarbons cannot, do not burn as easily as smaller ones, and this limits the use of bigger ones as fuel. So in terms of the uses of the fractions, uh, refinery gas fraction can be bottled and used for heating. This is the ones at the top. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the gasoline fraction can be used for car oil. And the diesel fraction can be used for fuel in trucks and in trains. Okay, that's where you get the combustion from. So in terms of a video, In this video you will learn how fractional distillation separates crude oil into useful fractions. Crude oil is the term used to describe unprocessed oil. That is oil that has been taken directly out of the ground, either on land or under the sea. It is an exceptionally valuable resource. It provides us with a great number of hydrocarbons, some of which are useful as fuels, and others are used in the manufacture of many different chemicals and even plastics. However, in the raw form as crude oil, it can be a viscous, dark coloured, tar-like consistency, and the different fractions of hydrocarbons must be separated by fractional distillation for them to be useful. Before we understand how fractional distillation works, we should be clear that crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons with different chain lengths, some being short molecules and some being very long. Intermolecular forces act between molecules, and the longer the molecule, the greater the intermolecular force. As you can see here, 
the small molecules have weaker intermolecular forces and so will require less energy to break them apart and turn them into a gas. They have a lower boiling point. The longer molecules have greater intermolecular forces. More energy is required, a higher temperature will be needed to evaporate these molecules. They have a higher boiling point. Now we understand how chain length is related to the boiling point of a molecule. Let us look at how this method works. As you can see, crude oil is heated up to a high temperature outside of the fractionating column. The hot crude oil, now mostly in vapour form, is pumped into the column. The column has a heat gradient and is very hot at the bottom, going cooler as we move up to the top. Even at the very bottom of the column, where the temperature is still high, some long chain molecules with high boiling points begin to condense back into a liquid. These are collected at the bottom of the column. The rest of the molecules start to rise up the column, making their way through bubble caps in each tray. The bubble caps slow down the rate of the rising vapour, and eventually the vapours get too cool, condense and are collected as liquids in the trays. Small molecules have low boiling points, and so condense much higher in the column, where the temperature is cooler still. As you can see, hydrocarbons with similar boiling points are collected in the same tray, and this is why they are known as fractions. They are mixtures of hydrocarbons with similar boiling points. Each fraction has some important uses. Some examples of fractions are petrol, useful as a fuel for cars, naphtha, used in the manufacture of chemicals, kerosene as aircraft fuel, diesel oil, used as fuels for vans, cars and lorries, and bitumen, a mixture of large chain hydrocarbons used to lay roads. Now, at the end of this video, you should understand that crude oil is a mixture of important hydrocarbons, and that fractional distillation is the method used to separate crude oil into useful fractions with similar boiling point. You should understand that small chain molecules are collected at the top of the column since they have lower boiling points, and larger chain molecules are collected further down the column as these have higher boiling points. So obviously uh, with the combustion of these fossil fuels uh, there's going to be problems uh, with pollution and first of all the carbon dioxide produced when hydrocarbons are burnt leads to the greenhouse effect which we've touched on earlier. Uh, rain is naturally acidic at a pH of about 5.6 because of the dissolved carbon dioxide. Acid rain however has a pH which is less than 5.6 because of various pollutants. And those pollutants are the byproducts of the uh, impurities associated with at least uh, fossil fuels in terms of sulfur and also uh, involved in the combustion energy uh, engine when it comes to nitrogen. So sulfur dioxide is caused when sulfur atoms which are present in some fossil fuels are oxidized to form sulfur dioxide, which we see sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide can also be um, further oxidized reacting with oxygen in the atmosphere to form sulfur trioxide. So what happens is that sulfur reacts with oxygen in combustion to form sulfur trioxide and then that sulfur dioxide and trioxide reacts with water in the atmosphere to form sulfuric acid, acid rain. Okay, so sulfur dioxide plus water gives sulfuric acid. Okay, just got to balance the equation. There we go, 2H2SO4 plus a little bit of oxygen. Okay, 
So the other uh, form of um, pollutant is nitrogen oxides. Okay, so nitrogen is not present in uh, the fuels themselves, but present in the air, which is used as part of the combustion process. Okay, so because of the high pressure and temperature involved in the combustion engine, you end up forming these uh, nitrous oxides. Okay, so what happens basically is nitrogen plus oxygen forms NO, 2NO, or uh, nitrogen plus oxygen can form um, NO2. Obviously, that's not quite balanced. You need uh, two of those and two oxygens. And these nitrous oxides can then react, okay, with water in the atmosphere to form nitric acid, which again causes acid rain. So in terms of the atmospheric pollutants associated with um, combustion, you have carbon dioxide, of course, greenhouse effect, carbon monoxide due to the incomplete combustion of fuel and car engines, uh, NOx, uh, NO2 and NO3. Okay, so when we have that, we just use X, where X is either 2 or 3. Okay, and sulfur dioxide, the NO3, NO2 coming from uh, the reaction of nitrogen and oxygen inside car engines and sulfur impurities that burn fuel. So carbon monoxide is poisonous. Um, you've also got oxides of nitrogen uh, oxides um, to react with other pollutants in sunlight to form smog. A very uh, big problem in China, for example, causing breathing difficulties, and also forms acid rains, we saw in the last slide. And other effects include killing plants and aquatic life, eroding stonework, and corroding metals. Um, the reaction between limestone and sulfuric acid um, is, is an example of this due to the stonework involved. Okay, so you've already seen that in previous lessons of what the reaction is there. Uh, the solution to acid rain involves removing sulfur from fuels. This reduces the amount of sulfur dioxide and uh, using catalytic converters in cars to remove sulfur di uh, dioxide and these nitric oxides, but we won't go into that quite yet. Okay, and that's pretty much uh, all you need to know about crude oil. Uh, the next topic, we'll look more in depth at these molecules, uh, which crude oil is made of, called the alkanes.